welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that rambles through lots of different topics across film, art and media. This is a special one because it's the first in-person recording, not with someone I live with, since March 2020. On the 28th of July, I visited artist Susan Hughes at her studio in Belfast and she kindly let me poke around and chat about her work. As you'll hear, Susan works across lots of different media including video, audio, music, painting, storytelling and sculptural light boxes and a lot of these incorporate text, light and colour in some way. Susan is very drawn to water and land that is near water. Susan is a graduate of University of Ulster's Masters in Fine Art program and we talk a little about her experience of completing that during Covid restrictions. Before I play you our chat, my huge thanks to our fantastic patrons at patreon.com forward slash AV cultures for your generous support. Together our patrons are funding our website and every now and again tech upgrades and I really wouldn't have come this far with audiovisual cultures without them. So if you want to join and help that process and help that work as well as getting lots of exclusive extras and early releases then please have a look at our tiers on Patreon and see if there's anything that works for you. And if you just want to drop a one-off fiver for example. There are buttons on the website which is audiovisualcultures.com or please just show support by sharing with a friend and giving us a nice review wherever it is that you listen. I'm a huge fan of Susan's and I hope by the end of this chat you will be too. Enjoy! Somebody doesn't live with me that was in person was in March 2020, just before oh the end times. <laughs> so you are the chosen one, Yay, Susan. <laughs> so it's really class to be in your studio and have a wee poke about and see your work in the flesh. That's really cool. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I suppose for anybody listening, how we know each other mm -hmm. is through Joanna Leach, who's a big friend of the show and has been on herself. And she did the Bending Glass show by Neon a few months ago. And you were one of the incredible people who gave some of your work to that. That was how I discovered you existed. Because I've been away from... Belfast, Northern Ireland for quite a while and I've missed a lot of people so you know it seems like I mean you've you've been on the art scene for quite a while but you did your MFA there wasn't it you graduated last year so you seem to be really prominent this year but that's my perception from being quite far outside so I mean if you're happy Susan would you like to give us just a bit of background about yourself and mm -hmm say what you want to say and tell us a bit of an introduction to your work and then we'll start picking through and see yeah. what we can... Sure, um, well I did, I'm 38 now and I did my degree, you know, like, mm. what, what is that, 20 years ago, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, 20 years ago in the art college here in Belfast and I studied painting, but then it was a big gap, what, like 17 years I guess, until I did my masters and in between then you know, I did different things. I was, a, I was an art teacher in a school and then I kind of got a bit disillusioned with the education system and decided I wanted to get back into art and have a proper practice. So I left teaching and I did a lot of residencies and that, I suppose, developed a methodology or a way of working where I would... My fiddle, I play Irish traditional music and so my fiddle would kind of track me to certain places mm -hmm. in Ireland and Scandinavia as well and I learned uh, Norwegian folk music as well and then in those places I would swim in the sea and the music as well would be like a, a way to learn about the land and the sea and also it's like currency so you can like swap a tune for a ride in a boat mm. or for 
some someone will bring you up the mountain or you know you can kind of get to know people quicker get into the society quicker so I became really interested in I suppose folklore and storytelling not necessarily just folklore but also those kind of experiential things and dramatic stories I, I would hear about um the sea and mm. they were all entwined with my own experience as well experiences as well of swimming and the relationships I would build with people you know romantic relationships as well and that intensity that is then associated with the physical environment so yeah I did quite a lot of residencies in um, Norway and I've done a few on islands I really like islands my daddy is a bird watcher mm-hmm. so that would have become something I got interested in myself when I was about 18 I started mm-hmm. I went to volunteer with the RSPB on, on Rathen Island um, and then a few years ago I went to a little island in Iceland that was the bird sanctuary so yeah the, the birds and, and those kind of really um, islands are places that are kind of on the edge which is where the birds go to like mm. places that are on the outer perimeters of say Ireland or Iceland that they stop off at mm-hmm. those are places that really interest me and they're usually quite harsh and dramatic mm. places but then yeah I did I did my masters I graduated two years ago and that oh, changed changed everything you know like it, it's um I'd been working in a very like limited palette mm-hmm. I was doing collages these little sort of sculptural oh yeah things they're actually I suppose this was before my masters but yeah those kind of the colors of the sea in Ireland in winter basically Mm -hmm. greys and turquoises and browns and things and um i was using a lot of photography and typing Mm -hmm. on i've been using text for a long time now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and everything was quite autobiographical and personal but then when i did the masters i kind of came out of myself a bit more i started using other people's stories Mm -hmm. and other people's experiences and I was interviewing people and then kind of retelling their story but through a lot of video I suppose my final show would have been a mixture of video and installation this here big box that was also in that show that Joanna had yeah that was part of my uh, master show and I was I suppose having the facilities in the art college of you know a, a technician who can help you mm-hmm. with it um, your video editing mm-hmm. to get to a higher level and um, just the tutors kind of pushing you out of your comfort zone yeah you know and, and getting the confidence to try materials and you know I don't know anything about sculpture mm-hmm. but none of us know anything about anything you just yeah. have to get on with it and try it you know and I suppose what what is what you do have even if you're trained in something else is your eye and you're like I wanted things to be a certain aesthetic yeah yeah and I knew I knew what I wanted you know I'd have mm-hmm. to I, I started to learn how to outsource as well and you know mm-hmm. that everything didn't have to be done by my hand I could yeah. get the Perspex guys to cut, cut things mm-hmm. to measure yeah. and I could employ someone to make me a box that was really really crisp and perfect mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I could make myself so that was a pretty mind blowing, you know, and yeah. even things like making video. I always had this the feeling of everything had to be completely authentic, and and the if I was making a video where the subject or the story was about a certain place, the old footage had to be from that place. But then, you know, I started learning about foley artists and yeah, yeah. how if you want to create drama and story, you're, you, everything is kind of impossible, and you can. Mm-hmm. If the story is authentic and your telling of it can be authentic without having the, you yeah. know, all of those things having to be from that place. So yeah, mm-hmm. things like that were really interesting. And the masters, I suppose, that any kind of further education. I don't know. Belfast is particularly good for supporting you with learning how to write proposals and things like that, and getting you better at talking about your work and articulating yourself. So all of that has helped me get more opportunities since mm-hmm. graduating as well. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, you had a solo show a few months back, uh, April, I think, wasn't it, um, mm-hmm. with Platform? It seemed very based around that idea of there's a lot there's a lot of language, really interesting use of language. It's just how somebody has said something, so the idea of swept, but it was attached to the story that you'd picked up somewhere, and I've been really drawn in by your use of text because it feels 
abstracted but it's very much linked to something very real for either yourself or for somebody else maybe it's somebody you know or somebody you've read about or interviewed or something like that and I uh, I'm just so interested in how you're using the way somebody has said something and it's often quite accidental you know and spontaneous or you know, they haven't sort of sat and thought about something. I need to say something profound about this, but it comes out in quite a profound way, but it's quite accidental. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I think I started that. I've always been writing myself, you know, but I was looking at my father's bird watching books. It's kind of, they're like ledgers, I suppose, where he would have taken notes when he was in the early days of bird watching. He was so extremely nerdy that he would like write detailed accounts of, Mm. every place that he went and the bird and how he how the bird's flight was and mm. so I started looking through those and yeah it's this like accidental poeticism mm. whenever I isolated things that he had written they were just so beautiful mm. and they could also um when they're taken out of the context the viewer can then invent their own narrative yeah. so they become uh, like more malleable or something yeah you know yeah so I really enjoyed playing around or, and like placing my own words with beside his yeah because everything that I write is so like self-consciously <laughs> poetic and <laughs> I'm trying to be yeah xyz you know and it affect it's so affected okay really you know by all the the, ty- the types of writers that I enjoy reading and I'm so paranoid about what people think about what I write mm. or what I make whereas his stuff isn't like that or, or someone someone who's just telling a story mm. Well, the people that have managed to get hold of to tell stories, a lot of them were completely unconscious of, of that kind of thing, you know. But then when I combine it with my own stuff that is more self-conscious, it kind of changes it then mm. again, you know. You mm-hmm. can't play around with it. It's almost like an active encounter. They, these two stories might meet each other and then you just have these moments of just drawing together almost. I was reading some of your stuff on your webpage this morning and... That's how it felt when, you know, you would compare your account of an experience with an account that a friend had told you of an experience they'd had that was entirely different. But there are these moments where they almost pinch together or they repel each other. Mm-hmm. But they're just, of the, you know, they're of the two sides of a coin almost, mm. you know. It's the way, it's a perception, it's the ways of thinking things, it's what's been misremembered or what do we change when we're retrospectively looking at something and we might have been incredibly anxious in the moment and terrified not knowing what was going to happen next but then you look back and you go oh everything was fine actually I knew where I was you know so <laughs> you know that that's that, those bumping into each other moments mm. I think in your work yeah. are fascinating yeah they kind of because you're I think you're talking about um mm. The story I interviewed a neighbour of mine, Morna. I mean, she, she I just cut her hair and <laughs> she's my friend. But then one day she just mentioned, or her boyfriend, um, like they're both in their 70s, like, you know, her boyfriend mentions them, oh, you know, that time when Morna got lost in the jungle. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh, you need to tell me that. You got lost in the jungle, Morna? And then she told me the whole story. And then I was like, just, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And then I asked her, can I come back and tell me the story again I'd lost that kind of initial yeah. thing of her telling it but she told it again perfectly you know yeah, again yeah. She, she's she's a beautiful speaker and she is good with words but she she's kind of carefree as well so but anyway her interview I transcribed it and she talked about you know getting lost but also really specific things like climbing up um, a particular empty riverbed and you know the animals and the sound of the animals slithering at night and she couldn't see them and when when you're transcribing I'm sure it's the same for you when you're listening mm. over audio mm-hmm. it's so immersive and you kind of get obsessed with this voice and mm. and her um her voice and her story kind of merged into my own memory of an experience of getting lost in the mist in Donegal mm-hmm. with my friend and I started it was the weirdest feeling it was kind of like psychedelic I suppose you know that I felt like I was Morna and I was in her body mm. and then I was remembering my own body imagining climbing down in this particular beach in Donegal and and then being in the mist with my friend and you know just these two stories I was completely obsessed with them and they started to merge and mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. sometimes they would 
have these uh, moments like what you were saying where they they become like inversions or like they meet mm -hmm. where she's talking about climbing up the rocks and I was imagining climbing down rocks and mm -hmm. oh yeah she was talking about starting to hallucinate I, so yeah I did like a big map I, d I printed out both of the stories and I started to like make a code between mm -hmm. what was common where were their animal signs mentioned where were their where was the weather? What what was the sea doing in both of these different mm -hmm. places? I don't know. It was just it was just fun to do that, and yeah. it really like broke open language and narrative as well, and mm -hmm. and that thing of the loyalty to the story. It kind of freed <laughs> things up, and your the the fact that everyone remembers things differently means that then everything's open for possibility mm -hmm. as an artist and representing things. You know, mm -hmm. I suppose we're standing in front of eyes like cats and that's relating to something quite similar as well where wasn't it you were talking to somebody in Donegal and they were describing how people used to be before lots of light pollution and things and people how well people could see in the dark before all the flats and you know, so you've got these three words on the on the square light box and it's quite a reddish colour it's a, well, it's interesting because we're in the time of the three word slogan, I think, <laughs> as well. Get Brexit done or <laughs> stuff like that. And Eyes Like Cats, it's just so pared back, you know, so there's that pared back use of, I suppose the, the words are extracted. And it feels almost, not quite, but it feels almost like a haiku where you're trying to fit some, something big into quite a tiny space. And you're economical with the language, you know, so I find that really fascinating as well. But it's not just the words, it's the combination of the words and the colour and the light and the sharpness, I think, because you're very specific in the fonts that you choose as well. So there's a crispness to it, so it's striking, but there's no punctuation, so there's nothing to tell the reader how they're supposed to take this in any way you know it's very it's free but yet it is structured because they're on top of each other they're in a list almost and it's it's just just looking at it, it's really class because it's they're all four letter three four letter words and you stare it long enough it's like i mean i get my eyes tested all the time so it's a bit like looking at you know the eye test in them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Like, what kind of process do you go through to choose the words out of the whole story? And then the decisions you make with it, whether it's a rectangle shape or a square shape and what colour, you know, what is there a process? Is there a structure or is it intuitive? You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes it's really easy. It just jump, jump like the eyes like cats. The, the man who phoned me. I was writing notes and writing notes and where he was saying a lot of stuff. Everything was amazing, but at one point he he was talking very fast in this like really thick Donegal, <laughs> Southwest Donegal accent. And I could understand him like 95% of the time. It was the odd thing I, I, did, I couldn't understand what he said, but um, he just, he was saying, uh, I said like, what about we were talking about phosphorescence in the bog, which mm. are these we it's will of the wisp you would have called it in England, and the lights in the bog. Anyway, I've never seen them. I've seen it in the sea, but not in the bog. And I was saying like, why do people not know about it? You know, and do you think people it doesn't exist anymore? Somebody's like, no, no, it was always there. It's all, it's always there. It's all there all the time. You see, and you see, the thing is, you don't, you don't realise it, but people in Edinburgh say, I like cats. <laughs> you just said it really clearly. <laughs> and it came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh my God, that's so perfect. Yeah. It's like the best thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and um, that was just really easy. Yeah. And it made sense. It was like perfect for, for all the different, all these different concepts I was thinking about. He'd said it better than I could ever say it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then in other circumstances I would like with the interview with Morna I had loads of phrases taken out you know and then it's look looking at how they work aesthetically mm -hmm. and if I decide I want to make something with text I know I want it to be a light box and this is the like the this is the saying light mm -hmm. so I knew if I wanted to make a light box that's square certain words are going to fit it mm -hmm. and this one was a replica of a 
a sign that hung in a cafe on the Orme Road, mm-hmm. Three Bars Cafe. And I knew I wanted to make a light box, the same dimension with the same materials, that orange 1970s orange perspex. Uh-huh. But then the dimensions, I don't know, I can't remember what it, that is. It's like two metres by three quarters of a metre or something. Mm-hmm. That meant that only certain phrases would fit well, you know, so it's like the graphic design is really important then, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Well, so some decisions are made yeah. for you, you know. And that one, is it the, the dark had come again? That's what mm-hmm. that one says on mm-hmm. it. Yeah, which is, it's a concept that sort of hits you when you hear it. When I first read that, my first, I think Joe sent me a picture of it. And I went, oh, <laughs> it stops and makes you think for a moment the dark had come again because it's so again it's very simple words simple phrasing but there is something you can take that's much bigger Mm -hmm. from it because you go yes you're right it does keep coming again and (laughs) but it's the past tense of it I think as well you know when you really break it down I mean I've sort of got a English literature background as well so analyzing the words and really you know, teasing it all out is uh, quite interesting to me and the past tense it had come again mm-hmm. and that idea of it had come again and you know it will come again but that's not what it says it says it had come again mm-hmm. and it's that it's experiential or something almost places you in a position of experiencing that the darkness had come again you know mm-hmm, there's something mm-hmm. that could apply to so many and it could be poetic it could be figurative darkness mm-hmm. it could be all sorts of things you know loss of memory and and I suppose in a way that's what was happening with that story it wasn't just that it was a literal retelling of of being lost in the jungle it was that there's probably going to be gaps in the memory of that because mm. what was real and what wasn't because mm. this person had this entirely individual experience and if there was hallucination involved and slight unhinging because of the situation because it was a couple of days yeah. and stuff then yeah. you know that's it's just a fascinating idea I think mm. and put so simply like that but very boldly you know because that's the thing the colours are bold mm-hmm. and it fitted so well with the neon because it's that kind of tone, isn't it? It's that kind of popping, bright colour, almost mm-hmm. garish. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's going to grab your attention. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big thing for me, I suppose. The, mm-hmm. Like, my subject matter is, you know, the coast and, mm-hmm. you know, very earthy, the sea and the land. And then my materials are neon perspex vid digital video and then even within the digital videos i would use like synthesizer sounds and like very crisp shapes that break my footage as well but that's all to do with kind of like trying to shock the viewer as well into a kind of conscious or trying to make them see things or Mm. trying to encourage them to see but using the, the like urban urban aesthetic and and also it's about representation like I can't represent what it feels like to swim you know Mm -hmm. in really rough weather or to to be lost in the mist in a valley in Donegal that is associated with really dark fairy Mm -hmm. stories you can't replicate that so I'm not going to even attempt Mm -hmm. to you know represent it in a representational way (laughs) But, but I can I can kind of use these materials more effectively. It's hard to describe, but I mean, underlying everything is for me is a kind of terror to do with uh, you know the climate and the that that comes from humanity's disassociation mm-hmm. with uh, and, and like disloyalty to natural patterns and habitats and all of those things. So. I find it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that like mo- a lot of artists are having to deal with now where everyone is concerned about, mm-hmm. not everyone, a lot of people are concerned about the climate and feel this responsibility to make work about it and they want to make work about it because it's like at the forefront of their mm-hmm. minds mm-hmm. but it's so hard to, you, if you're preachy about it, mm. it tips. You, it just becomes boring and it, it's already like outdating all these ways of making work about the climate and mm-hmm. the environment are get so dated so quickly mm-hmm. so it's just a thing that we're mm-hmm. all having
something to kind of navigate around. Yeah. But, but for me, this, like... I think the... And the neon as well comes to, from um, in Killy Beggs in Donegal. It's a fishing port. Mm. A kind of very disturbing fishing... Like, I don't eat meat or fish, but, like, the size of those fishing boats mm. is so terrifying. And, okay. it, and um, so Killy Beggs is a weird place for, for me, but... <laughs> When I go through it, it's this kind of grey, you know, the the blankness of the scene. It's always grey. It's beautiful, you know, but there's, uh, you know, the the railings along the harbour mm-hmm. to stop you your car falling in or to stop you tripping. It's they're they're painted in this extreme neon. It's this hair oh, colour. Right. Okay. High vis orange. Yeah. And I re- I just a couple of years ago I went through and I was like, oh my god, that mm. colour. It's like so seductive and shocking like shocking the way it mm-hmm. punctuates the grayness of the environment mm-hmm. and I, I just loved it it was yeah seductive I was just completely seduced by it mm-hmm. and I saw it I mean it's always they've always painted railings red and orange and stuff but I think because of modern pigmentation you know that things there's fluorescence is more around and more mm-hmm. cheap, cheaper to reproduce so I did go back and I bought a tin of that paint. I mean, it was really expensive. It was like a hundred mm. quid or something like that for a tin. And I'll never get through it all. If anyone wants any fluorescent orange paint, <laughs> let me know. I've got too much of it. But that was a, a sort, of, sort of turning point for me. You right. know, you start using these really bright colours yeah, to yeah. like punctuate and mm. shock. Because I suppose that that's the element of safety. You were saying about terror and there's a it's it's a warning mm-hmm. you know it's there's a warning mm-hmm. that there could be danger here there and you're talking about swimming in the sea and these are choppy seas and they're very cold seas that we're talking about mm-hmm. so there's going to be danger so there's have you read Carrie Nadoherty's book Thin Places oh yeah she talks a lot about that mm-hmm. she's it's a nature book and it's memoir all through each other and she's mm-hmm. from Derry originally mm-hmm. and one parent was Protestant, one was Catholic and she's about the same age as us I think and you know so had this very strange childhood, very dual childhood and she was very drawn to the bogs and um, lots of sea swimming and stuff and mm-hmm. she talks about the precarity of that, the the danger that's involved, the times when that's almost part of the thrill is, am I going to survive this swim? Especially if it's a night mm. swim or something. Mm-hmm. It's really immersive and cold and but exciting. There's th- it's thrilling and great at really evoking the place through words. And you know, I'm thinking and remembering reading that book when I'm seeing your images mm-hmm. and hearing you talk about your own experiences of swimming and you know, things like the, the neon orange and stuff mm-hmm. that element of being so visceral with the land and the sea you know and it's almost like it's as if you're more alive because of the prospect of the danger that that's what's coming across to me at least mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah I like the edginess yeah, you know. So it's really interesting that you're talking about bringing that boldness of colour because it's not for the sake of it. It's these are colours that warn you about something, mm. or as you're saying, like in in the middle of a what would be considered maybe a bleak mm-hmm. vista, you know, mm-hmm. sort of land seascape. There's that pop of colour that's saying, "What? No, we actually can't be complacent about this." Mm-hmm. And it, it's the it's the kind of um, the bodily thing as well, like the the way neon and light boxes have an effect on your body when you come into their space. So like the light spills onto the floor yeah. and the seepage, the yes. flicker, the the way what it does to your eyes, like it's <laughs> very bodily and and the whole link to club culture and mm-hmm. dancing mm-hmm. and the body and all of that is important you know important references as well for me just thinking about the names of your shows as well we're talking about works that were attached to shows that were named things like lost not lost again that use of language there's duality coming in there there's that mixed experience I mean I always come back to this because that was a lot of my research but I think so many of us 
from this place, you know, from this island, from this city, from this time, we have some sort of duality always because, you know, certainly of our age, being young people in a conflict, you know, where it was very sectarian, it was split up, um, it was one side against another side and that kind of thing. So that is probably boring for people that I always come back to that, but I just spent so many years being in that that, you know, it feels like there's no escape. So even if it's nothing to do with that, but it's that idea of you're this thing and you're that thing, that's the opposite of it. You know, I feel like that's coming through quite a lot in your work too. I don't know what you mean. So um, just that idea of, well, you're lost, but you're also not lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I I wouldn't really think about that so much when I'm making the work, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it makes total sense. Like, and I'm, I'm from a mixed marriage mm. family as well, so... There is that kind of, I play Irish music, but I didn't know anything about Irish music growing up. Mm. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a whole world there. You yeah, know, exactly, of, yeah, Of like sort of being with your foot in two different places. Mm. And that kind of sense of belonging when and your family being kind of separated because just of people going to England to find work, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. thing as well. And like where I feel very rooted here, but... Mm -hmm. Not everybody does and yeah kinda, yeah I don't know it's a, it's really fascinating as well to hear about not just the freedom almost that the fiddle playing has seems to have brought but the bartering um, I hadn't really come across somebody who'd paid their way by offering a tune before or at least you know, not in the contemporary context you're know, not doing it right now I mean did that come about organically for you or you know how how was that because it's very performative you know it's very um present very live mm -hmm. and then it's how planned is that you know mm -hmm. is that an intention or mm -hmm. is it just oh I'll play you a song if you'll if I can mm -hmm. or I, I don't have the money can oh I? it's much less I mean yeah <laughs> in the back of my mind I'm flat trying to okay. you know get in wheedle my way into places right. but you know it takes like it's just the fiddle is this amazing, amazingly powerful tool. Okay. Like, I, especially in Norway, I think I went to, did a lot of residencies in Norway. And when I was there, you know, because it's like, you're just another person. You're just another artist. But then whenever you play fiddle, <laughs> everyone starts paying attention to you and you're playing Irish music that everyone loves. And so then people are drawn over to you. And uh -huh. then once you get talked, or it like opens up conversations I suppose mm -hmm. and once you, you're having conversations with people you can ask oh where would I go to find where would I go to go for a good walk and then yeah. they'll be like I'll take you <laughs> and then you know and then I met or yeah, yeah I don't know just and then everyone then introduces you as the artist who also plays fiddle mm -hmm. and then they're interested in that more than you know people can relate to music it's like much less alienating than the mm -hmm. art scene and it's it, it's totally social as well whereas art is so solitary mm -hmm. so I'm lucky to have the both but yeah Norway like jeez I mean it was because of my music that I would have gotten to know a particular guy who I ended up going out with mm -hmm. but you know through him you know we had gigs we started a little band we had gigs and then um, you know I met way more people that way and mm -hmm. he would have brought me out in the boat and yeah it's very or organic but in it was when I went to, when I was like, oh God, like 16, mm -hmm. I went to Lourdes, you know, oh, the pilgrimage, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Christian wheelchairs oh, right. with the youth team. <laughs> and when I was there, I was playing what, classical music, you know, I was in the, the uh. school of music, orchestras and everything, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't play any Irish music or anything. But when I went to Lourdes, we would go to the pub every night, like it was amazing. You were, it was legal to drink mm -hmm. as a teenager when you're 16 there. Whereas here it was 18, happy so days, it was yeah. happy days. <laughs> it was class, just boys, and it was amazing. And um, there were these ones who were playing, and they, who who were in the youth team, and they were playing like you know Wild Rover and Whiskey in the Jar and stuff, okay. guitar. And the, the, there was a girl from the school of music who I recognised, but she managed to obviously learn a few of these songs mm. and everyone wanted to be their friend and everyone <laughs> wanted to buy them drinks oh yeah and I was like I have to get yeah. in on that <laughs> so I went away and I just learned just things like that and then 
I got more into it, but it, it was then that I realized that kind of opening, mm. opening, it's like a passport or something, you know. Saying that, like, I've traveled, like, I remember going to China with someone um, many years ago, and I brought my fiddle, and no one was interested. Right. Like, mm. You know, so it, it, it depends on the society, you know, and mm-hmm. you can't push it on people as well. Yeah. Some people hate <laughs> yeah. traditional music. <laughs> that's okay <laughs> but yeah it's it's and the relationships that I've built with people through music have a lot of those people have totally like been my muses and like uh-huh. totally fed all aspects of my creative output you know mm-hmm. the experience that we, I would go for walks with people go swimming with people who I've met through music mm-hmm. so all, all that you know mm-hmm. is there anything about your practice you want to talk about that I don't you know because I've come to you fairly recently you know Mm. there's a lot I don't know and you know I've hooked around on your website and things Mm. and you've got lots of stuff there but is there anything maybe what you're working on at the minute or anything that you feel has really emerged that surprised you you know is there anything sort of about your work that I maybe haven't picked up on or haven't known about or anything that you think you'd like to talk about I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's pretty hard for me to talk about my work because it's really varied and yeah, all the outcomes yeah. are quite diverse. I don't yeah. fit into it. I'm not like a sculptor or a video artist. I do loads of things. Like my last show was an audio installation and two big, massive, blown up screen prints mm-hmm. of underwater photos that I took. You know, there weren't Whereas previously, loads of people wouldn't have known me as doing video work, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so yeah, it doesn't really neatly. It's not easily categorized, but but yeah, I think you've covered loads of. Yeah, well, we like uncategorized. Yeah. <laughs> on my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe you don't want to go over this, but it might be, I don't know, maybe helpful for some people. You did your MFA while we were in lockdowns and. You know, at the height of the pandemic mm-hmm. and stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. looking back on quite a bit of that now, mm-hmm. what was that like for you? Do you think it brought out extra challenges or do you think, you know, the limitations actually mm-hmm. benefits not maybe necessarily the right word, but maybe some yeah, positives? Yeah, both. Maybe? Like, I mean, there, were, there was no partying mm. going on. There were no sessions. I just went to the art college all the time. It was amazing. I got, I was so focused mm. and I didn't feel compromised, if you know what I mean. You know, I didn't, I was just, I was just absolutely class. Like, but <laughs> um, at the same time, we didn't, and we were allowed to go in to college. Like okay. I, we, we, we thought we were being robbed because we could only go in from nine to five, Monday to Friday. Mm. And other colleges everywhere were just closed. Yeah. And everyone was doing their, trying to make their art in their bedrooms. Yeah. So we yeah. were absolutely spoiled rotten. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but we, and we had our crits and our tutorials and, you know, it was quiet. Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't come in. A lot of people were nervous and just like set up studios at home anyway. Sure. So it took, it, there was a bit of, a, a lot of grieving about that, mm-hmm. realising that, you know, the three people who came in every day, that was kind of it. We had our mm-hmm. own sort of smaller community, but, you know, everyone came in for their crits and we did have our final show, but no one could come in and see our final show. Aww. It was really sad. And it's like, the, you know, the work that you make, you're, you're in control of the exhibiting environment in the art college. You're, you install everything yourself. Mm-hmm. So I made, you know, I had this beautiful dark room and everything was pristine and exactly how I wanted it. And it was really immersive and yet no one could experience it. We had like video tours and everything and mm-hmm. loads of people attended who wouldn't have otherwise, you know, like curators from yeah. all over the place and friends from... Canada and Australia and South Africa mm-hmm. so, so it was amazing that way but um, yeah we had to we had to kind of mm-hmm. mourn the loss of our final show mm-hmm. which will never never be yeah. recreated again like I, I mean my light box that mm-hmm. I made for that that was just one element mm-hmm. of this whole sort yeah. of project that I was presenting with video and audio and the darkness so that'll never mm-hmm. be recreated but that's fine yeah yeah and they're always great crack, the big openings of yeah, those. Yeah. You know, when I was living here, uh, that was one of the highlights of the year, was the yeah. the student shows. Mm-hmm. 
not the college, so that's a real shame. But that's why, like, Joanna's uh, Bending Glass exhibition, that kind of felt like for me, yeah. um, um, a bit like uh, the final show that I never, mm. I never had because it was so celebratory and there were so many people of all different ages and mm. um, it was exciting, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Great it was, energy. Definitely. And it was really nice inclusion, you know, and the light, the idea of the light boxes just fit so well because there were so many, I think Joanna's thinking was that the, there were so many light boxes for the studios in the UTV building where it was that had been taken down and removed and there was this visible absence you know this absent presence of there used to be a light box there and just mm -hmm. so to have your light boxes in that space it, it really complemented everything else that was going on mm -hmm. and you know again the types of color because while they're not neon we would describe those colours as neon shades of those colours, you know, so it, it fits yeah. so yeah. beautifully. Yeah. If you find text useful with your podcasts, we've got two options for you. You can subscribe to Audiovisual Cultures Podcast on YouTube for captioned videos. And you can visit audiovisualcultures.com and click the transcripts tab. Both sites are linked in the show notes, along with information about this episode. Well, Susan, I mean, it's been so cool to hang out in your studio. That's so exciting. <laughs> Do you have places you'd like people to go to see more about your work? So a website and socials mm -hmm. and stuff where people can actually see some of what we're talking about? Yeah, my website is susanhughesartist.com and that has pretty comprehensive archive of the projects I've been doing over the last few years. On that there's also a link to a blog where, where I've been doing writing over hmm, I don't know 10 years mm -hmm. from different locations around County Down and Donegal and Norway and Iceland and then I'm on Instagram as well at Susan Dorothy Hughes. Wow that's, it. that's great. And yeah, do you go and check all those out because, yeah, your work's very cool. It's... Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> I am a big fan. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this and giving me so much of your time. I'm sort of bursting into people's lives a little bit at the minute. <laughs> so it's really kind of you. Um, That's great. I really appreciate great to have it. You. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much.